All right, so if you have questions, we will collect those. I know some of you are passing them around. Michelle is right here in the back, so she can grab some. Um, I think we might need this extra mic. But I collected some on the break. So thank you for those of you that, thank you. Thank you, thank you to those of you who contributed some questions here. Okay, so let's, let's uh, oh, thank you more. Um, all right, let's go with this one. If it's an emergency, do you still have the choice of a mechanical valve or a cadaver valve, or is it the doctor's choice? Does anybody in the room want to take that one? Perfect. And here comes a mic. Um, the ideal situation is having the patient come in still alert enough to have a conversation. Um, if they're younger, you know, mechanical valves are best because they do last the longest, which means you have the lower risk of needing reoperations in your future. If the patient's not conscious and there's no family there, we can't just put a mechanical valve and expect that person to take Coumadin. And that's a really big ask. And so, you know, we always hope that we can have that conversation, but if it's not possible, we will use a, a valve from an animal usually. Okay. My son has a bovine patch. Yep. Yes. And I didn't get asked, and I'm totally fine with that. <laughs> okay. This says, and forgive me, I'm just trying to read with the light and the handwriting. Um, do cardiac rehab programs incorporate yoga? And if not, can patients ask for it to be included? Um, <clears throat> I don't think they do. I think if you, if you ask specifically for it, you know, you'd have to have someone who is a teacher, right, to be part of it. So those research um, papers that I presented, that's where they incorporated it. I'm not aware that we would offer uh, yoga as a, as a part. Um, but I think once you get out of surgery, and Dr. Palmer would have to answer that, but once you get past a certain stage, which she should say, um, you should, if you wanted to, you should probably just find a yoga teacher, a personal teacher, and, and do the yoga. But I don't know exactly how long she would you know, ask you to wait. I'm not quite sure, but. <laughs> then the physical therapist, and so they usually say, you know, at two months you can lift up to 20 pounds, but really you want to give yourself at least two months, ideally three, before you put too much pressure on that chest because the bone is being held together by wire at that point and not completely healed. And so downward dog, for example, one of the positions that Dr. Gessel showed, we would not want you to put all that pressure upside down on that chest. And so make sure um, your surgeon signs off on that before you do it. But I think after the three-month mark, it would be very good you know, to incorporate some type of practice like that. Um, a second thing I would mention is most people ask about chiropractic adjustments and things like that. And so that also, I would say, wait at least two months, ideally three, before you do something like that after open heart surgery. Hmm. Thank you. Okay. Uh, with dissection from, from aorta to the groin, can the whole aorta be fixed all at once, or is it several surgeries? Yeah, thank you. That's a great question. Um, it depends. Uh, again, the, so the goal of surgery is, in, in the case of aortic dissection, is to stabilize the aorta so that the dissection does not continue and to provide blood flow to the gut, uh, to the liver, to the spleen, to the lower legs, and to the kidneys. Um, the challenge with trying to fix the aor all the aorta at once is that it comes at a sacrifice of blood flow to the spine, usually. And, and in so doing, while we could do that, um, the patient ends up perhaps paralyzed, unable to walk. So, so you have to walk that very, very tight balance where, okay, am, have I, you have to do enough to stabilize the aorta and give all these vital organs blood flow while still maintaining blood flow to the spine so that the patient is able to walk. That's, that's the short of it. 
Thank you. Okay, what do emergency rooms test for if someone is experiencing a coronary artery dissection versus infection? Cardiac enzymes, question mark. How would we know that that's happening? Experiencing a cor coronary artery dissection. Moore is probably also an expert at dissection, I'm not sure. Um, yeah, so nobody knows if you have a dissection, um, coronary dissection. So you come in and you have the typical symptoms of a heart attack, and everybody assumes that, and finally uh, brings you to some sort of study, right? Either the imaging study of a CAT scan nowadays, uh, if it's relatively low risk, or someone says, no, you, you gotta go to the angiogram. So that's what, what, for example, I do. So you inject some dye into the arteries directly, and then you can see it. But un unfortunately, just by the presentation, you won't be able to tell. Now, if it's a, a young woman, and there's a heart attack, I think many people will have the suspicion that that might be the case, but it still doesn't mean it will be the case. If you had the history of it, then yes, there's a lot of you know, predictability, but unfortunately you won't un until the very end of the, the exam. And then we often don't do anything about it. So we are not like Dr. Manunga who you know, has to stand all of that or not, but I mean, in many cases he might. In our cases, unless it's really, really a bad uh, location, we try to actually not treat the di uh, dissection of the coronaries and let it heal uh, by itself. Or if it's a small territory, you will, we would rather have that small muscle die, um, which is not impacting your heart overall too much, instead of going in there and doing something because we might even make it worse if we try to fix it. Because his artery is like three, four centimeters big, ours is two, three millimeters. If you make your wire manipulation in just the wrong spot, you cannot bring that back. Mm -hmm. So that's why. Thank you. If someone has discovered they have a bicuspid aortic valve, how often should they have that checked? <laughs> no pressure. So usually a, a cardiologist would answer this question, but, but for bicuspid valves, not all of them fail. And so it's really, um, I think personal family history is important because if you have several family members who have had bicuspid valves that have either become too tight or too leaky and have needed open heart surgery, you probably will be mo needing more frequent monitoring than um, if you were you know, to have a bicuspid valve and that valve is working fine. And so it's really up to the cardiologist manage, managing you. Um, I would say it's usually every year or every couple of years, but um, I don't know, I, I, maybe Dr. Moore can answer this a little bit more. Yeah, I was just gonna say, if it's functioning normally, then it may be as infrequently as every five years, depending on family history but as soon as there is a narrowing or a leak, then it may become more frequent. Um, if it's just mild, it may be every couple of years, and then as it gets to more moderate or severe, then it's annual, maybe even with some advanced imaging, like CT or MRI as well. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, this one says, for Dr. Murphy, I have post-surgery mental health symptoms about two years after Manageable, but bugging me. Should I speak to a primary doctor? Oh, that's right. She's joining us from Australia online. So perhaps we can have that in the chat, and then we can go back and read that on the YouTube. Perfect. Thank you for bringing that up. So you found that online, and we're directing that at her. Okay. Sounds great. Okay, is there any knowledge of risk of dissection for patients with a unicuspid aortic valve? This is different from other bicuspid aortic valve types, I'm assuming. So is there, is there any risk of dissection for patients with unicuspid aortic valve? 
I would assume so, so but I am not a doctor. Again, I would <laughs> defer to some of my colleagues as well. But in general, it's more about the aorta itself, not so much the valve. Okay. There can be a unicuspid valve with a normal sized aorta, um, which, of course, would be evaluated if they ever decided that they needed, if, if the doctors decided they needed replacement of that valve. But just having a unicuspid valve doesn't necessarily mean that you'll have aortic disease as well, although it's more common in that, in that syndrome. Okay. Forgive me. I'm going to do my best on this one. What is the difference between coronary artery dissection versus myocardial infraction, I think is what it says? Infarction? Infarction. That was going to be my next guess. <laughs> Thank you, doctor. Um... Want me to do it again? Yeah, no, no. I, I mean, you got so it. The, the myocardial infarction is basically uh, a heart attack, right? So that's the other word for heart attack. Okay. So if your muscle does not get injured by the dissection, which is possible, then you didn't have a heart attack, right? So everything that has to do with the heart muscle, if that gets injured in some way or fashion, uh, gets a little less blood flow. Um, then we call it a heart attack or myocardial infarction. Um, the dissection itself is just you know, these vessels that you saw that there's a flap inside the artery in some way, um, but that per se does not necessarily mean you had a heart attack. I would say it's very likely that you also have a heart attack with that, but just to have it inside the vessel doesn't mean you will or did have a heart attack. Oh, she has a response. Awesome. All right. Thank you, Dr. Murphy. So the original question was, I have post-surgery mental health symptoms about two years after manageable, but, but it's bugging me. Should I speak to a primary? Yes, absolutely. Go to your primary care physician, and they will arrange for a referral to a mental health professional. It would be great to have some assistance in your mental health management rather than having to continue through on your own without any professional help. Ideally, go to someone who knows about uh, cardiac conditions as well. So, thank you. Technology these days, medicine these days, these things are amazing. Okay, so this one says, for patients with left, uh, left bundle branch blockers post, sorry, post aortic valve surgery, I rapidly get, I repeatedly get to more than 160 beats per minute with running, even, if, even though I'm in good shape. Is this expected or is this worrisome? Predictions? So I would say the increase in heart rate probably isn't related to the left bundle branch block. Um, left bundle branch block is a situation where one of those little pathways that I showed um, is not conducting normally and that can predict the need for a pacemaker at some point in your lifetime. Um, the fast heart rate, it's hard to know what that is, and if that's normal, it would have to be um, monitored, and then we could look at the tracings and see if it was a normal rhythm or just a different heart rate response after surgery, which is certainly common. If you already had surgery for a 5.5 ascending aneurysm and aortic valve replacement and now have a distal aneurysm at 4.9 centimeters, what is the monitoring criteria or timeline? So generally speaking, um, distal aneurysms are fixed in the chest when they reach five and a half centimeter in women and six centimeter in men. This is in people with no connective tissue disorder. For patients with connective tissue disorder, the threshold's a little lower because the aorta try to rupture or leak in a, at a smaller size than people without connective tissue disorder. If the aneurysm is below their kidney arteries, then we fix them at five centimeter for women and five and a half centimeter for men. Once an aneurysm reaches four centimeter and a greatest diameter, the recommendation is that we scan that patient every six months. 
Usually, we, we scan people just once a year. If the aneurysm is less than four centimeters, by a four, four and a half centimeter, then the, you should be seeing your doctor every six months with a CT scan. No more aneurysms grow at about six millimeter every year. What will make a doctor fix an aneurysm sooner that if, if it hasn't reached these thresholds, so five and a half centimeter or five centimeter, any aneurysm that's growing faster than six millimeter every year is not obeying the law. So you, the police will give someone who's speeding a ticket so they won't get in an accident. Uh, so, so the same principle apply. So you try to fix this aneurysm, even though it's a smaller size, you fix it because it's not behaving the way you expect it to behave. So you get ahead of it so it doesn't rupture because people don't do well with rupture. Elective surgery is better than emergency su surgery at any time. Right. So, but at five and a half, you should be having scans every six months. At four and a half, every six months. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you guys so much for contributing those questions. We're gonna stop and pause there, but if we have any that we didn't get to, or if you leave them on the table, we'll make sure to gather those and we can put those into the conversation and respond to those by email. So thank you for, thank you for all the great questions. I was nervous I only had two the whole time and then we got a stack at the end, so thank you. All right, well, be, on behalf of Rock for the Heart, thank you for attending the symposium today. Thank you again to Edwards Life Sciences, uh, Alliance for Aging Research, Social Indoor, 104.1 Jack FM, Minnesota Vikings, Abbott, W.L. Gore, and Associates.